How is it possible that a kid who was rejected from design school would go on to be the creative director at one of the world's most powerful fashion houses? Well, in this episode of Thread Education, that is exactly the question we're going to be answering. Now, a lot of you have been requesting this very video, and it's for a good reason. Because if you ask me, Matthew Williams has had one of the craziest journeys out of any designer that we'll talk about. So without further ado, let's get into it. This is the Matthew Williams story. In 1985, Matthew Williams was born in Illinois, but at the age of two, he would relocate to Pismo Beach, California, and so that is where he spent most of his childhood. Growing up, one of his greatest passions was soccer, and as he entered his teenage years, he began to take it much more seriously. In fact, at the age of 16, he traveled to Europe for the first time so he could train with professional soccer teams. As he discusses in an interview with GQ, this was an eye-opening experience for him because not only was it his first glimpse into the world of European fashion, but it was also his first glimpse into the world of techno music. In America, he had grown up listening to rap, but techno was much more popular in Europe, and as we'll discuss in just a bit, this newfound taste in music is actually something he would bring home with him. In the meantime, however, soccer was beginning to have an influence on his style, and he actually credits the sport with helping him get into fashion. He recalls having always paid close attention to the way that he and his teammates styled their uniforms, and he even began collecting jerseys. Now this doesn't mean that Matthew was walking around dressed like a soccer player 24-7, and it's fair to say that his style at the time was more heavily influenced by skate culture, but the reason I bring this up is that it tells us his sense of fashion is heavily rooted in sportswear, and if it weren't for soccer, he may have never even pursued a career in the fashion industry. To provide some context, he was slowly beginning to arrive at the conclusion that he wanted to be a designer, and with that in mind, he applied to Parsons School of Design in New York. His application was rejected, but he had been recruited to play soccer at the University of California Santa Barbara, so he ended up enrolling there as an art studio major. It may not have been exactly what he wanted, but all things considered, things were going great for him. Little did he know, however, that the trajectory of his life was about to change forever. Through soccer, Matthew befriended Keith Richardson, who happened to own his own clothing brand called Corpus. He was on track to finish school and continue playing soccer, but when Keith offered him an internship, that all changed. Deciding to take a chance, Matthew dropped out of school and relocated to Los Angeles where he began working for Corpus full time. And although he had no prior experience, he quickly found himself in charge of the brand's denim production. It wasn't easy, and I guess you could even say it was risky considering everything he walked away from to make it happen, but it proved to be an extremely valuable experience because it showed him the ins and outs of running a brand. So he was now working in the fashion industry, but you might be surprised to learn that he was also now working in the music industry. As I mentioned earlier, his time in Europe exposed him to the world of techno music, and combining this with his love for rap, he began DJing at local nightclubs. As he recalls in his interview with Show Studio, he wasn't even old enough to drink when he became a regular DJ at a local spot called Spider Club. Through this gig, he began making connections, and one of these connections led him to a job offer designing for a brand in New York. Now, I do want to mention here that around the time he got this job offer, he had just started dating a girl named Jennifer. She was working at Maxfield, which was a popular fashion boutique in LA, and one night at a club, the two of them ran into each other. He noticed that she was wearing Dries Van Noten, struck up a conversation, and from that point forward, they started dating. It was about three months after that when Matthew got the job offer, and while the two of them hadn't been together long, they decided to pack their bags and move to New York together. Unfortunately, this venture would be short-lived because just six months after moving to New York, Matthew was fired from his job. He himself admits that the firing was justified because he spent more time going out and clubbing than he did focusing on his work. But the part that hurt the most was that it also took a toll on his relationship. He had already been spending most of his nights out at the club, but when he got fired, he had no choice but to start DJing full time. This meant he was out of the house just about every night, and so it wasn't long before him and Jennifer broke up. Now even though they were no longer together, keep Jennifer in mind because she will come back to play a very important role in this story, but for now just know that Matthew was alone, he'd been fired from his job, and he was unsure of what the future held for him. If I had to guess, I'd say that this was one of the lowest points in his career, but as it turns out, his luck was about to change. After spending nearly a year and a half in New York City, Matthew decided it was time to return to Los Angeles, and it's a good thing he did because if he hadn't, there's a good chance we wouldn't be talking about him right now. You see, shortly after returning to LA, Matthew happened to run into a woman who was at the time working as Kanye West's stylist. 
This was perfect timing because Kanye was preparing to perform at the 2008 Grammy Awards and she was looking for a designer to help make a custom suit jacket. She decided to give Matthew a shot and this resulted in the now iconic jacket with animated LED lighting. This jacket was an obvious hit and Kanye ended up liking it so much that he invited Matthew to join his creative direction team. Now many of you have been asking for a video about Kanye's journey through the fashion industry and rest assured it is in the works, but for the purposes of this video, just know that around this time Kanye was preparing to launch his own label called Pastel and he figured that Matthew's skills as a designer and his experience working on the production side of things would be a big help. So that is how he began working with Kanye West, and we will be talking about their relationship more in just a bit, but before moving on, there's one other thing that happened to Matthew in 2008 that we have to talk about. As the story goes, he went out for sushi one night, and by complete chance, he found his next love connection. The crazy thing here is that this love connection was with Lady Gaga. It might seem a bit random, but the two of them met while out to dinner with some mutual friends, Matthew told her about the work he'd done for Kanye, and then she invited him to help with some costume designs. From this point forward they began working together, and not long afterwards they began dating. His official title was the creative director of House Gaga, which was the name of Lady Gaga's creative team. In this role, he designed many of her onstage outfits, and more generally, he helped curate the aesthetic of her personal brand. This was ultimately a very important period in his career because it provided him with the opportunity to showcase his work on a high level, and it also allowed him to start forming more connections with other people in the industry. That being said, it was also a very weird period in his career. Prior to dating Lady Gaga, he was relatively unknown in mainstream media, and most of his work took place behind the scenes. But seeing as she was one of the biggest musicians in the world, their relationship inevitably became a public relationship. Matthew was now appearing in paparazzi photos, and Lady Gaga's fanbase even began referring to him as Dada. So like I said, this must have been weird for him, but at the same time, he'd never been happier. He was finally working in fashion like he'd always wanted to, he was in a great relationship, and keep in mind he was still working with Kanye. Now many people don't know this, but in 2009, Kanye and Lady Gaga were actually planning a joint tour. The tour, which was going to be called the Fame Kills Tour, was supposed to be for Kanye's album 808s and Heartbreak, and for Lady Gaga's EP The Fame Monster. The reason that many people don't know about this is because the whole thing was cancelled after Kanye infamously interrupted Taylor Swift at the 2009 MTV Video Music Awards. As you may recall, the media used this incident as an opportunity to vilify him, and wanting to avoid any bad press, Lady Gaga backed out of the tour. At first it was announced that the decision to cancel the tour was mutual, but Kanye would later claim that the decision was hers entirely. So the reason I bring this up is that this clearly put Matthew in a very difficult position. On one hand he was dating Lady Gaga, and on the other hand he was working for Kanye, who by this point had become one of his closest friends and mentors. So when the tour got cancelled, he had no choice but to pick a side, and that's what he did. Matthew and Lady Gaga ended their personal relationship in 2010, although their professional relationship would extend into 2011 as he directed her Monster Ball tour and then finally her campaign for Supreme. I want to be clear in saying that we don't know for certain if Lady Gaga's feud with Kanye is what led to their breakup, but I have to imagine that it did create some tension. Whatever the case may be, Matthew had made up his mind, and from there on out he began working full time as an art director for Kanye's creative company Donda. Heading into 2012, things had never been going better for Matthew Williams. He rekindled his relationship with Jennifer, and was now helping direct Kanye and Jay-Z's Watch the Throne tour. Traveling around the world with them was by itself a great experience, but the best part for Matthew was the friends he made along the way. You see, Kanye had brought him on board to help with creative direction, but he wasn't the only one. Among the other members of Kanye's team were Virgil Abloh, Heron Preston, and Justin Saunders. As Matthew recalls, the four of them were staying at the Lanesboro Hotel in London during the Watch the Throne tour. They had gone out clubbing a few nights, but quickly realized that none of the clubs were playing the music that they wanted to hear. Then, one night, they went out and were able to work their way into a DJ booth, and this gave them the chance to play whatever music they wanted. Not only did they have fun, but because they had some prior experience DJing, they were actually pretty good at it. It had started off as a very informal thing, but when the party was over and they found themselves back at the Lanesboro Hotel, they knew that they needed to formalize it, and that is why they created Ben Trill. Ben Trill was the chosen name for their DJ collective, and at first, that's really all it was meant to be. But when they started selling t-shirts, people started treating it more like a streetwear brand. And over time, that's what it became. Ben Trill was started in London, but they brought it back to New York with a pop-up store on Canal Street, and before long, the brand had spread around the world. 
Thanks to their use of a drippy font, hashtags, and other bold graphics, they were putting out some of the most recognizable pieces in streetwear at the time. And this included now iconic pieces like the Bentrill Chief Keef collab, the Bentrill Stussy collab, the Bentrill Travis Scott collab, and the Bentrill Hood by Air collab. Now if you watched my video about Hood by Air, you'll know that there was actually some controversy behind the Bentrill Hood by Air collab. So a little bit of background, as I mentioned earlier, Matthew was dating his former girlfriend Jennifer again, and it just so happens that she was now working as the sales director for Shane Oliver's Hood by Air. She introduced Shane to Matthew, and the two of them decided to collaborate on a t-shirt design. But as we now know, there was some miscommunication about what the shirt would be used for. In his interview with Kerwin Frost, Shane explains that he was under the impression that the shirts would be a one-time exclusive for attendees of a brunch that included the HBA team, the Bench Row team, and some members of the ASAP mob. He then goes on to suggest that Matthew was under a different impression and basically began mass producing the shirts for commercial release. These shirts subsequently became one of the most popular pieces that either brand has ever put out, and it was even seen on Kanye West. While you might think that he'd have been excited about that, Shane was less than pleased with the whole situation, and while we don't exactly know why, my best guess is that he wanted HBA to be viewed as a high-end luxury label, and Ben Trill didn't really fit into that picture. You see, Ben Trill was really nothing more than a way for Matthew, Virgil, Heron, and Justin to mess around with design concepts, and in many ways, it quickly evolved into a hype brand. That's exactly what Shane was trying to avoid, so it's entirely possible that he viewed the collaboration with Ben Trill as a step back rather than a step forward. While I guess we can't know for certain what he was thinking, what we do know is that by 2013, Ventrell had become one of the hottest things in streetwear. A lot had changed for Matthew in just the past year, and for the most part, everything was going great. But as he was about to find out, the next year would bring challenges he never could have imagined. I'll start by saying that 2013 was the year that ASAP Rocky dissed Bentrill and his song Multiply, and it was also the year that they began working with Paxson, which was, in many ways, the beginning of the end for them. While working with Paxson made the brand more available to the many fans who wanted to buy it, it also eliminated the exclusivity factor. Demand went down as supply went up, and in retrospect, we now know that Bentrill was just a few years away from being sold to Paxson entirely, meaning that Matthew, Virgil, Heron, and Justin would no longer be associated with the brand. In the meantime, however, they were still associated with the brand, and this leads me to what is undoubtedly the biggest challenge Matthew has ever faced. In 2013, the Ben Trill Collective was scheduled to perform at Coachella, and while on the way to see them perform, Matthew's father unexpectedly died in a motorcycle accident. It goes without saying that this devastated him and his family, and as tragedies like these often do, it forced him to take a step back and reevaluate things. This was the darkest period in his life, and nothing about it was easy, but there was light at the end of the tunnel. You see, the same year that Matthew's father died was the same year that he married Jennifer, and Jennifer was pregnant with a daughter a daughter that they would name Alix. Matthew's life was changing quickly, and in need of a mental reset, he quite literally disappeared for a while. Leaving his phone at home, he flew to Ibiza and ended up staying there for nearly three months. And by the end of those three months, he'd made a very important decision. He was going to launch his own label. Launching his own label is something that he'd dreamed of doing since he was young, and doing so gave him a sense of control when he needed it the most. He wanted to do things his way, and so that's exactly what he did. From the very beginning, he knew that he wanted to produce his pieces in Italy, because that would allow him to achieve the level of quality that he was looking for. And to make that happen, he partnered with Luca Benini. Luca Benini is a fashion industry veteran with extensive experience in manufacturing, marketing, and distribution. The two of them were introduced through Matthew's wife, Jennifer, and the rest is history. The first order of business was of course picking a name, and as I alluded to earlier, he decided to name the brand after his newborn daughter, Alix. With that settled, Matthew got to work, and after nearly a year and a half, the first collection was complete. Something interesting to note here is that this first collection was actually a women's wear collection, and the reason for that traces back to Lady Gaga. According to Matthew, his time spent designing her onstage costumes inspired him to pursue women's wear, and so when he started Alix, he decided to focus all his attention on that. The first men's wear collection for Alix wouldn't debut until nearly two years later in 2017, and it wouldn't be until 2018 that the brand made its runway debut. You see, when preparing for his first runway show, Matthew ran into a few unforeseen problems. First off, because the pieces were being produced in Italy and he was based in New York, they had to go through US customs before he could get them in hand. And unfortunately, the entire delivery got delayed for so long that Alix missed its first ever scheduled appearances at New York Fashion Week and Paris Fashion Week. 
To make matters worse, during the lead up to his now rescheduled debut, Matthew was playing in a charity soccer match, and after making a wrong turn, he broke his leg so badly that he had to have it reconstructed with metal plates and even had to learn to walk again. That's why in photos from this time period, you'll usually see him walking on crutches. While this was of course a major setback, he persisted, and when Alix did finally make his runway debut, it was an instant hit. People fell in love with the brand's industrial reinterpretation of high-end fashion, as well as its seamlessly woven in elements of both streetwear and sportswear. While the brand's body of work speaks for itself, its explosion in popularity was in large part thanks to a few particular pieces like the chest rig, as seen on Kanye, and like the roller coaster belt buckle, as seen on just about everyone. I mean seriously, these belt buckles were one of the biggest fashion trends in recent memory, and Alix was at the forefront of it all. While originators of trends like these are rarely paid their dues, I think it's fair to say that Matthew was paid his. His longtime friend Kim Jones invited him to collaborate on Dior's Spring Summer 2019 collection, and the roller coaster buckle stole the show. He was also invited to collaborate with Nike, and again, the roller coaster buckle was the main focus. Now, don't get me wrong, this is by no means the only cool thing that Alix has ever done, and it is certainly not the only reason that the brand is popular, but I do think it's a great reflection of its industrial aesthetic, and it's been pretty cool to see it make its way through the fashion community. So in 2016, Matthew was selected as one of the finalists for the LVMH Prize for Young Fashion Designers. I've talked about this in several of my videos, but all you really need to know is that it is an extremely prestigious award, and many of the designers that make it to the final rounds go on to be some of the biggest names in the industry. Even though he did not end up winning the prize, the nomination did help further solidify him as one of the top young rising designers, and over the next few years he would continue to prove himself collection after collection. Now before moving on, one interesting thing that I want to mention is that in 2018, Alix was officially renamed 1017 Alix 9SM. At first, this might sound a bit weird, but there is actually a reason behind it. The 1017 is a reference to Matthew's birthday, October 17th, and the 9SM is a reference to the address of the brand's first studio in New York, which was at 9 St. Mark's Place. Just to be clear, he doesn't expect anyone to refer to the brand by its full name, but if you think about it, this rebranding is sort of a cool concept. For those who know what the full name means, there's now an additional layer of meaning, and for those who don't know what the full name means, it kind of looks like a serial number which is complementary to the brand's industrial aesthetic. I'm not sure if that's what he was going for, but it is one possible explanation. Anyways, there's no denying that Alix is one of the most popular labels to have emerged in recent years, and Matthew has established himself as one of the most promising young designers. So promising, in fact, that in 2020, he received an offer that would change his life forever. In June of 2020, Matthew was officially named the new creative director of Givenchy. At the time, Givenchy was in desperate need of revitalization, and in a sense, they decided to follow in the footsteps of Louis Vuitton by hiring a self-made designer that had no formal fashion education, but who had already proven their ability to resonate with the younger generations. And to do just that, Matthew actually got some help from Playboy Cardi. This is the first campaign material we received following the announcement that he would be joining Givenchy. The visuals were shot by Nick Knight, who was a close friend of his dating back to the Lady Gaga days. And yes, you heard that correctly, that is Playboy Cardi in the background. It may come as a bit of a surprise, but Matthew and Cardi are actually very close friends. Cardi has even gone as far as saying that they treat each other like family. The two of them first met at a studio in Miami, and they've pretty much been working together ever since. In fact, alongside Kanye West, Matthew was listed as one of the executive producers of Cardi's most recent album, Whole Lotta Red. But back to Givenchy, Matthew made his directorial debut with the release of his Spring 2021 Ready to Wear collection, and I have to say, he left quite the strong impression. I guess you could say that it was a higher end version of some of the work he'd done at Elite's. The collection was mostly defined by its sleek look, dark color palette, boxy cuts, and it featured some familiar pieces such as the chest rig. I think that his real stamp on the collection was the use of locks, which is something that he teased in the campaign material we just watched, because as we alluded to in our discussion about the roller coaster buckle, functional hardware seems to be one of his signature design elements. Now since his debut, he's gone on to release several more critically acclaimed collections for Givenchy, with the most recent being the Givenchy Resort 2022 collection. 
This collection includes what I believe to be some of his most experimental work since arriving at the fashion house, and with the help of graffiti artist Cheeto, it also marks some of his most heavily streetwear inspired work. Stuff like this is exactly why they brought him in, and so far it's been a success. At the end of the day, he's still settling into his role at Givenchy, but from what we've seen so far, I think it's safe to say that the future is bright. So that is just about everything I wanted to touch on for the Matthew Williams story. And truth be told, it is a pretty crazy story. He started off with dreams of becoming a soccer player, and in a twist of fate that led him to fashion. He got rejected from design school, but was somehow still able to network his way into a job. With a little bit of luck, he was able to start working with Kanye and Lady Gaga, and from there, one thing led to another. He became one of the founders of Ben Trill, after that he founded Alix, and once he had proven himself to the industry elites, he was chosen as the new creative director of Givenchy. As we've talked about, it hasn't all been easy for Matthew, and he's had more than his fair share of setbacks along the way, but that just makes it all the more impressive that he's landed where he has today. No question about it, he is one of my favorite designers, and now that you know a bit more about him, hopefully you understand why that is the case. Anyways, that is all for this episode of Threducation. If you liked this video, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and other than that, I will see you next time.